I think there's um there's a very uh, dynamic competitive market in Bitcoin mining on the security side of the network. And I think there's a very dynamic competitive market in uh, Bitcoin and the exchanges. And I think there's a dynamic competitive market in the applications, so call them the banks or the financial applications themselves. And all three of those are very Darwinian to the benefit of the network. So for example, you know, I can, if I take an S19 miner and 30 megawatts of energy, I can create an exahash. It took me 150 megawatts of energy to create an exahash with an S9 miner. If you take the generation before that, you're talking about 500 megawatts of energy. So if I'm sitting on mining equipment after six to eight years, I'm obsolete and my break even, the break even point for the S19 is 40 cents, 45 cents a kilowatt hour. The break even point for the S9 is nine cents a kilowatt hour. The break even point for the previous generation is two cents a kilowatt hour. What's happening is the Bitcoin mining network is upgrading its technology and squeezing off the grid all of the obsolete or the third generation, the older technology. Um, if you can't upgrade, if you don't have the money to buy the new generation technology, you got to pay the price with energy. And at some point you need 50x as much energy. You can't afford to pay the price. You're, you're getting squeezed out no matter what. Um, if you can't get the Bitcoin mining equipment vendor to sell to you, like what if Bitmain won't sell to me? Okay, well, you're still losing. It's a competition to maintain the trust of the vendor. You know, there's a competition at the hardware layer. If you don't like the fact that Bitmain controls most of the market, you go to another vendor and you get them to manufacture a mining rig, which is comparable. Okay, so we're continually creating new hash power. That's competitive. We're looking for cheaper sources of energy. That's competitive. If you trusted a free source of energy in China and the government cut you off, well, you lost. That was a bad decision. And so you're looking for political support. If the energy provider isn't trustworthy, if, if they pull the rug out from under you, you're, you know, you're out of luck, you're lost. If the politicians pull their political support, you're lost. If you can't upgrade your hardware, you're lost. If you engineer your mining facility poorly and you don't do the right heat dissipation, you burn out your rigs, you're lost. If you can't raise capital in order to buy new mining equipment, you're lost. If you don't have the trust of the capital markets, right? Marathon and Riot are publicly trading. They can go and they can raise equity and debt. If you can't go public, you're at a disadvantage. If you're in a market where there are no capital markets, the Chinese can't take their Chinese mining companies public. They're at a disadvantage. And so on the mining side, there's a, comp there's a competition for capital. There's a competition to engineer mining facilities. There's a competition to design semiconductors, SHA-256 mining rigs. There's a competition to operate. By the way, you can't get ripped off by your employees either, right? <laughs> All of these things, there's a competition to find uh, supportive political jurisdictions. That's never ending. What's the result on Bitcoin? Uh, Bitcoin gets more secure and more robust and more, more anti-fragile. It's not inflationary, right? Because the protocol is locked in. The only result is the network decentralizes or like, would Bitcoin be at risk if all the mining was in one place and one politician could turn it off at the same time with a snap of a finger? Yes. So <laughs> what happens when someone does that uh, on a small part of the network? It teaches everybody else and they decentralize and they're looking for places. If, if I'm going to invest $500 million in Bitcoin mining, don't you think I'm going to pick a jurisdiction where they're not likely to outlaw me in the next decade? Like there's, there's a reason I might want to go to Texas and not go to, say, New York or California, right? I'm going to go find a supportive jurisdiction. So the mining network is, has got a very healthy uh, competitive dynamic across five different types of capital engineering capital, you know, semiconductor, technical capital, political capital, financial capital, you know, uh, and even human capital. So that's going on and that's good to the entire network.
Um, on the exchange side, well, you see that in process right now. All of the migration, you know, Coinbase is competing with Binance, competing with FTX, competing with Square, competing with PayPal. What's going to happen? Do I want a crypto exchange, a Bitcoin only exchange? Do I want a Bitcoin only non custodial? Custodial. Uh, do I want to have leverage or not leverage? Well, there's legal issues, there's, there's technical issues, there's market driven issues. Ultimately, the competition is driving more diversity and more choice and people are going to migrate to the thing they're most comfortable with. The other day I bought $30 worth of Bitcoin. Uh, you know, I bought it on one application and paid 69 cent fee. And then I went and I, I tried to uh, strike and I paid next to nothing. I thought that's kind of cool. Okay, so thank you, Jack Maulers. We appreciate that. Competition makes us all better, right? There's pressure and, uh, and that pressure will continue. So um, when will that end? That won't end, right? I mean, it was a, it, it's a Herculean lift that El Salvador managed to deliver the Chivo wallet in 90 days. But there's already people complaining about it. You know, it's custodial and it's KYC. And they'll be in the next thing. Okay, well, if, if we roll forward to the next generation every 90 days or every six months, you know, that seems pretty healthy to me. And uh, we need that, right? Because we can never make we can never make the exchanges too efficient. We can never make the wallets too functional or too secure. We're going to continue with that. And the beauty is, look, we need Square to do what they're doing. Why? Because you need a big company to actually compete with Apple. Apple Computer is not going to enter the Bitcoin space because they're threatened by a non-custodial wallet, you know, coming out of South America, right? They're not going to compete. They're not going to enter the space for Chivo either, but they will enter the space if they see Square and PayPal generating hundreds of billions of dollars of market cap. If you think that Square is going to take 500 million users off of Apple Pay, that will cause a response from a Facebook or a Google or an Apple. So it's useful to have that competition going there because, because we might want Apple to decide to buy 100 billion of Bitcoin and to build Bitcoin into a billion iPhones that might you know, create a secure element as a hardware wallet on the iPhone. That would be a useful thing. So that competition is useful in that regime. But on the other hand, the competition of, of Moon versus Breeze versus you know Strike versus whatever, I mean, that's useful too. Non-custodial versus custodial, lightning only. And there's gonna be a different wallet in every single country, you know, and you're gonna have jurisdictions that are gonna have an impact. So I think that's good. And then I, I think the third area we talked about that I mentioned is just applications or banking apps. Look, um, MicroStrategy has a convertible bond. There are hundreds of billions of dollars of capital that can buy convertible bonds. Okay. Is it good or is it bad? Well, it's the only Bitcoin backed convertible bond. There's only two convertible bonds in the world that are backed by Bitcoin, and we issued both of them. Okay, so then there's a junk bond backed by Bitcoin. There's one of them in the world. We issued it. Okay, um, there'll be ETFs. There'll be other kinds of products. They all compete with each other. Each one of them meets a different need in the market. Well, what if someone else comes along with a better bond? Okay, well, that's good too. You know, what if... if if Coinbase turned around tomorrow and decided to issue $20 billion worth of convertible bonds to buy Bitcoin, would I be upset? Well, you know, like maybe it would make the MicroStrategy bond less desirable, but on the other hand, make Bitcoin more desirable, and then the Bitcoin would trade up, and then MicroStrategy equity would trade up, and then the MicroStrategy bond would trade up. And so the competition is probably a good thing. And if uh, JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs decided they wanted to start to do this, you know, the, like uh, maybe that's a good thing for everybody. So I think ultimately, in fact, I won't say maybe, right? The competition is good. 
all the the more the more options there are for Bitcoin securities, the better it is for Bitcoin. The more options there are for Bitcoin wallets and Bitcoin exchanges, the better it is for Bitcoin. And the more competition in Bitcoin mining, the better it is for Bitcoin. The more Bitcoin mining rig companies, the better it is for Bitcoin. <laughs> Bitcoin wins no matter what happens. Having said all that, and this is what I say to entrepreneurs, if you have a Bitcoin company, you know, there's a 99% chance or a 99% failure rate for most corporations over a long enough period of time, right? There's a lot of, there, there, there were hundreds and hundreds of companies that wanted to be Apple's iPhone. And how many companies wanted to be Instagram? And how many companies wanted to be Facebook? You know, and how many companies wanted to be Amazon? For Amazon to win, 15,000 retailers have to lose. Okay, so competition is good for the underlying network. It'll be great for the protocol of Bitcoin. It'll be great for the asset value of Bitcoin. It's not good for the competitor. <laughs> like you're going to have to fight tooth and nail, you know, with every iota of your energy to succeed in whatever market you choose to go into. And if if you're going to go into that market, you need to have a set of strategic assets. Ideally, like for example, Fidelity has 22 million customers and they've been selling treasury services and funds to big institutions for the past 50 years. Can they offer a Bitcoin fund? Sure. Can they put Bitcoin into their fixed income fund products? Yeah, they have $2 trillion worth of that stuff. Okay. Are they going to defeat Square Cash App? No. Who's got more customers, Jack Dorsey or Fidelity? Jack Dorsey. He's got more than 20 million. Now, Jack Dorsey's not competing against Fidelity. He's competing against Apple and PayPal in a different way. And they've got their assets. So you, but, and, and so what's his advantage? He's more nimble than they are. And what's your advantage? Maybe you're more nimble than the someone bigger than you. And can you turn that into a compelling, sustainable advantage? Maybe. Apple did it. <laughs> Google did it. Yahoo came first. You can. Are the odds in your favor? No. What's the most rational strategy if you're a competitor? Take your entire balance sheet and invest it in Bitcoin and then borrow against your balance sheet to fund your operations, right? If, if you raised a hundred million dollars to build a new Bitcoin software wallet, I would say take the hundred million, buy Bitcoin with it, and now pay your payroll by borrowing against the Bitcoin. And if you succeed more power to you, you'll be worth a lot more than, you know, what's a hundred million, 20 Bitcoin per million. So you buy 2000 Bitcoin, right? So you'll be worth 2000 Bitcoin if you disinvest your treasury. <clears throat> I think Bitcoin's going to a million next stop, right? So 2000 times a million is pretty good. Nothing wrong with that. And if you're and if the business itself works, you'll be worth 4000 Bitcoin. But if you hold 100 million in cash and the business doesn't work, you'll be worth nothing. Worth zero. Right, that, that same logic holds for Bitcoin miners, right? If you're mining Bitcoin, you never want to sell any Bitcoin. And if you raise money, you want to buy Bitcoin with the money you raise. And then you want to borrow against the Bitcoin to pay the operating expenses. If you do that, if, if you believe in Bitcoin, it's, it's obvious. If you don't believe in Bitcoin, maybe you shouldn't be in the business. Like, if you're going to look me in the face and t if you don't think Bitcoin's going to a million dollars a coin and then $10 million a coin, I don't think you should be a Bitcoin miner. I don't think you should be a Bitcoin exchange. I don't think you should be a Bitcoin wallet. I don't think you should. I, I just don't think you should be. Uh, you shouldn't be a pure play focused in the business at all because you're already you're already a loser. You've already decided you're going to lose. If you think your assets going to zero, it's hopeless. All these other things. If you think it's not going to zero, then rational thinking is the competition in the market is making my Bitcoin more valuable. That's good. But the competition is making my existing business less profitable. That's bad. 
And if I'm a genius and I execute well, maybe I can stay ahead of everybody else. Maybe, maybe. But while I'm doing that, every single free dollar I can raise, I should convert to Bitcoin. Because there's many, out of a hundred possibilities, there's 99 paths where you fail and Bitcoin succeeds. And there's one path where you fail, where you succeed and Bitcoin succeeds. And, you know, some people don't think Bitcoin is going to succeed, but they're not, they're not with us, right? You don't think Bitcoin is going to succeed, go do something else, you know, whatever with your life, but don't, don't try to create a Bitcoin business.